Well, if you would take your Bibles this morning and turn to the book of Exodus, where we'll continue in our study where we left off last week. We've been going through the book of Exodus because we wanted to see a picture of God at work in our everyday lives. Uh, We want to know, as we say often, that He's more than a name on a page of paper in a book. We want to sense the reality of His presence. Amen? Amen. We want to know that He's real and He's alive. Unlike some of the gods that we read of in the Minor Prophets that say they have ears but cannot hear, eyes but cannot see, mouths but cannot speak, our God is alive and living. Amen? Amen? And that's what we want to see a picture of. And as we're leading up to this point where God is beginning to fulfill His promise to the children of Israel, He's beginning to give a Pharaoh a little bit of persuasion to think twice about what he's going to do. And uh, as we said, God said uh, regarding Pharaoh, he was going to harden his heart. And uh, over and over, we saw that Moses is struggling with his obedience. And he has his faith to trust God. And it's, it's a mountaintop valley experience, isn't it? It's like that in our own lives. We want to trust God, but yet it's hard. And, and yet Moses is there, and, and he's beginning to be used of God. And God is using him mightily. And over and over, he says, then they will... God. Over and over. So as we started last week, we began to see that God is really beginning to do a mighty work, and He gives Moses this tool in His hand. It's called a rod. It turns into a serpent, and He picks it back up, and it's a rod. And God gives him this tool as he goes to stand before Pharaoh. And as we noticed last week, he's beginning to send the plagues. And they're not real pleasant. I don't know about you, but I can't imagine all the water around me in the first plague being turned to blood. And as we said over and over, science tries to disprove and say it's nothing more than a natural phenomena. It's nothing more that, uh, that cannot be explained by science. Maybe it's the red algae, and maybe it's the dry uh, red clay pigments that are in the dirt, and maybe it's this, maybe it's that. It could be this, it could be that. And over and over, science has tried to explain away what God did. But we know who are believers that God is an amazing God. And uh, there's nothing he can't do. And it takes more faith that it could believe, or it could be this, or it might be that, than to just take it by faith that God said it and it's so. And so hopefully we'll begin to see this. So he turns the water uh, into blood and then he brings the frogs and, oh man, that would be disgusting, and the stench and so forth. And then the lice. And we said that in all these circumstances, God, through through the working of these miracles, is defying the gods of Egypt. Every one of these ten plagues defy one of the gods of Egypt that were prevalent during their day. And once again, why? Because God says they will know that I am the real God. I am the only God. And so we're going to begin to see as we continue in this that God is an incredible God. So he brings lice. And then we begin to read in Exodus chapter 8 as we continue in these 10 plagues. And we won't spend a ton of time on them, but I want to bring out some interesting points regarding each of them as we go forward. So we see this next one in Exodus chapter 8, the fourth plague, which is the swarm of flies. And we begin reading in verse 20. The Lord said to Moses, get up early in the morning and present yourselves to Pharaoh where you see, when you see him going out, of the wa- out to the water. Tell him, this is what the Lord says, let my people go so that they may worship me. Over and over, he says, not only will they know that I am God, but I want them to be able to come and worship me. Now, over and over, we're gonna, and we're going to see this a little bit later as we get into the middle parts of the book of Exodus, that some period of time has passed since the children of Israel had landed in Egypt, right? There's several hundred years here. And so as they are there, what happens in every culture is that some of the people, even though they were the children of God, they began to accept the gods of the land. Unfortunately, that took place. Some of the children of Israel began to gravitate towards the gods of Egypt. And over and over he says, God says, I have had enough. I want my children out so they can worship me alone. And he says that. That's the other recurring point that he says over and over. Here's verse 21, though. It says, but if you will not let my people go, then I will send swarms of flies against you. 
your officials, your people, your houses. The Egyptian houses will swarm with flies, and so will the land where they live. But on that day, I will give special treatment to the land of Goshen, where my people are living. No flies will be there. This way you will know that I, the Lord, am in the land. So he says, Pharaoh, I want you to let my people go. But if you don't, flies are going to come. But there are going to be a special treatment towards his children. In Goshen, there will be no flies there. Can you imagine for a moment, I'm certain that some of the, the Egyptian people be the part of the children of Israel. They didn't have to take flies in. And you notice that some of the plagues were against everybody. Some of them were against, against certain people. But here in this particular case, the children of Israel were protected from the flies. Although it is not clear which insect the Hebrew word Arab refers to, but this plague may have been against Kephora. Their god named Kephora. A scarab-headed god regarded as a manifestation of autumn or raw, so to speak. It was supposed to be the god of resurrection, perhaps because the dung ball in which it rolled around, in which it laid its egg, produced new creation. And priests of that day wore scarabs as charms. Imagine that. So once again, several of their Egyptian gods revolved around the idea of flies or scarabs, and they would lay their eggs in dung piles, and new creation would come out. And so the priest would put on this, this uh, oval-looking uh, uh, senator or some type of a, a, a medallion that would picture a scarab or a fly and um, supposedly give them that ability to produce new creation. Or it may have been against the fly god. One sorcerer in the new kingdom threatened, I will enter your body as a fly and see your body from the inside. And as a symbol of bravery, soldiers who had proven themselves were decorated with a golden fly. So once again, and on the underside of a heart scare from the new kingdom, it was laid on the heart of a mummy to ensure favorable testimony at the day of judgment. So even the Egyptians, although they did not believe in the one and only true God, they believed that there would be a day of judgment that would come. And so they would lay this golden fly on the chest of the mummies to, so to speak, protect them as they would face the judgment. But God says, I will send flies and they will swarm your lands and your officials' houses, and they will cover the land if you do not let my children go. And verse 24 says this, And the Lord did this. Isn't that amazing? God did exactly what He said He was going to do. And you know what? God has that tendency, right? God is a God who is faithful to His Word. He does what He says He's going to do. It says, And the Lord did this. Thick swarms of flies went into Pharaoh's palace and his officials' houses. Throughout Egypt, the land was ruined because of the swarms of flies. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Go sacrifice to your God within the country. He says, No, wait a minute. I'm not going to let you go. You can sacrifice inside. That was not what God wanted. God says, Let my people go that they may come and worship me outside the country. But Pharaoh wanted the flies removed. He wanted what he wanted on his terms. Where have we seen that before? Haven't we talked about that in this series? How we want what we want, but we want what we want on our terms. It doesn't work that way. See, in following God, we have to submit to what He wants and what He desires for our lives. Well, there's a little bit more to this story there. Verse 20 says, Pharaoh responded, I will let you go and sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, but don't get very far. Don't get very far. You can't have, you can't have partial obedience. You can't have obedience with stipulations. It's complete obedience or nothing. Well, go on here. It doesn't stop. Chapter 9, verse 1, we begin to see the beginning of the fifth plague. So then the Lord said to Moses, go unto Pharaoh and say to him, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says, let my people go so that they may worship me over and over. Let them go that they may worship me. But if you refuse to let them go and keep holding them, then the Lord's hand will bring a severe plague against your livestock in the field. The horses, the donkeys, camels, herds, and flocks. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, so that nothing of all the Israelites own will die. 
And the Lord set a time saying, tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land. So he's beginning to set a time frame. If you don't do this, tomorrow this is going to be the result. So we see there's some type of a moraine or anthrax that God is going to send. Um, verse 6, he says, The Lord did this the next day, and all the Egyptian livestock died, but none among the Israelite livestock died. So here's what it is. This judgment was against the bull god, revered as the, uh, revered as the early as the archaic period, and the sacred cattle of Hathor, the cow-headed love goddess. I mean, so every, everything that God did in destroying the cattle and the livestock, the donkeys, and everything that the children or, or the Egyptians own, God says, once again, you're going to know that your gods mean nothing. Nothing. And I am everything. It was a special reproach to Pharaoh who worshipped Hathor. And Hathor, whose name means house of whores, was sacred as early as the old kingdom. And other gods associated with cattle were Ptah and Ammon. And he says, look, your gods that refer to your livestock and your cattle and your donkeys, they mean nothing. Great cemeteries of embalmed cattle have been excavated. Isn't that amazing? In Egypt, Great cemeteries of embalmed cattle. The symbol of the bull was a symbol of Pharaoh himself. In the hymn to Ammon, it was difficult to distinguish the Pharaoh from the bull because the title is Adoration of the Amunru, the bull of Heliopolis, chiefest of all gods, the good God, the beloved, who giveth life to all that is warm and to everything that is good. That's what they believe concerning their gods that honored their cattle and livestock. Praise be to thee, Amun Amun Re, Lord of Karnak, who presideth in Thebes, bull of his mother, the first of the field, wide of stride, first in over Egypt, greatest of heaven, eldest of earth, Lord of what exists, who abideth in all things, unique in his nature among the gods, goodly bull of the nine goods, gods of, of chiefest of all gods, Lord of truth, father of the gods, who maketh mankind and created, created uh, all beasts. That was what they sang to their, to their bull gods in their daily rituals. And God's basically telling Pharaoh, you may consider yourself the chiefest, but you are once again nothing. And in verse 7 it says, Pharaoh sent messengers who saw that not a single one of the Israelite livestock was dead. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not let the people go. You would think after a while, after all these plagues begin to come into the, uh, the house of the Egyptians and the Egyptian officials and, and Pharaoh's house, you would think they'd get the point. I think Pharaoh was just a little bit hard-headed like some of us. God's trying to get our attention. He's trying to let us know that he's there. He's trying to say, I want you to obey me in this area. And we just persist and say, well, this is just coincidence. This is just something that you know, we're facing. This is, just, this is just an accident. And God's saying, no, I've orchestrated the events of your life so you might know that I am God. And we get kind of a little bullheaded once in a while. Well, you would kind of think that they get it, but they don't. So God has to bring a sixth plague. And we see this in Exodus chapter 9, verses 8 through 12. He says this, Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take handfuls of furnace soot. And Moses is to throw it towards heaven in the sight of Pharaoh. And it will become fine dust over the entire land of Egypt. And it will become festering boils on people and animals throughout the land of Egypt. Boils? Ugh. Blood wasn't enough. Frogs weren't enough. Lice wasn't enough. Flies weren't enough. Cattle being diseased and sick and, and anthrax or whatever it was in moraine, it wasn't enough. And now boils against the God of healing. I am Hotep was the name of the Egyptian God, an outstanding nobleman of the old kingdom. Although not actually defied until later than the time of Exodus, he was no doubt revered at this time, but he could do nothing to help the Egyptians. The goddess Segamet was also known for her healing ability. And yet, neither one of these Egyptian gods could do anything against the hand of God. Once again, God says, you put your faith and trust in gods, I'll let you know that your gods can do nothing to help you. So God sent the boils. And here's what he does here. Look at down in verse 10. 
So they took the furnace set and stood before Pharaoh, and Moses threw it towards heaven, and it became festering boils on man and beast. And the magicians could not, could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils were on the magicians as well as on all the Egyptians. Verse 12, But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had told Moses. Over and over, Pharaoh's heart just was getting worse and worse. But remember in the beginning of the story, God told Moses that he was going to harden his heart. Why? He will know in the end that I am God. Well, it doesn't stop there. We see another plague. Uh, Chapter 9, verse 13, the seventh plague. Then the Lord says to Moses, get up early in the morning and present yourself to Pharaoh. Tell him this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says. And notice this reoccurring sentence. Every time Moses was to go before Pharaoh, was Moses giving Pharaoh his own words? No. Over and over he says, you tell him this is what God has says. This is what God, the Lord has says. The God of the Hebrews. Let my people go so that they may worship me. Otherwise, I am going to send all my plagues against you, your officials, and your people. Then you will know that there is none like me in all the earth. But now I could have stretched out my hand and struck you out your people with a plague, and you would have been obliterated from the earth. However, I have let you live for this purpose, to show you my power and to make my name known in all the earth. So he begins to send this hail. The sky goddess, Nut, N-U-T, was the Egyptian god here. Uh, She was considered the mother of the sun god, Ra, whom she swallowed in the evening and gave birth to again in the morning. Interesting. How do you swallow the sun and give birth to it in the morning? Interesting. She was especially culpable in this plague in that she was supposed to protect the land from destructions which came down from heaven. And in Exodus 9, verse 31, mentions that the flax and the barley were, barley were hit and destruction of the flax was trying because it was used to wrap mummies and to make clothes. Even their ability to make clothes was hampered. And God says, they'll know that I am God. Over and over. And that wasn't enough. So we turn the page in Exodus chapter 10, we see another one. So hail didn't do it. So God sends that eighth plague. Chapter 10, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his officials so that they may do these miraculous signs uh, of mine among them, and so that you may tell your son and grandson how severely I dealt with the Egyptians and performed miraculous signs among them, and you will know that I am the Lord. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and told him, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may worship me. But if you refuse to let my people go, then tomorrow I will bring locusts into your territory and they will cover the surface of the land so that no one will be able to see the land. And they will eat the remainder left to you that escaped the hail. They will eat every tree you have growing in the fields. They will fill your houses and all your officials' houses and the houses of all the Egyptians, something your fathers and ancestors never saw since the time they occupied the land until today. Then he turned and left Pharaoh's presence. Think about this just for a moment. Everything, as we said over and over, was an attack against the Egyptian gods. Can you imagine as as Moses was standing before Pharaoh, looking out and telling him, there will be nothing left. Nothing. Hail destroys the flax, so they can't even make clothes. They can't use it to mummify uh, their dead folks. And now locusts is going to eat everything else. Swarms of it. There will be no trees, no grains, no nothing. The locust-headed god was called Senehem. During the plague, the locusts were so thick that the eye of the earth was darkened. And we see that in chapter 10, verse 5, they will cover the surface of the land so that no one will be able to see the land. It was so thick that the ground was covered with locusts. One of the epithets of the sun god Ra was the eye of Ra, and by causing the darkness while the sun was shining, Ra was discredited. 
I mean, here it is. Ra was looked to be as nothing because he couldn't keep everything shining bright. It was so dark. And they really hadn't even seen darkness yet. That's coming next. And they're going to know that once again that there's only one God. So we see that in chapter 10, verse 21. We see the ninth plague. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand towards heaven and there will be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness that can be felt. Have you ever been in something that dark that you could just sense it and feel it? I I think I've only been in maybe something that dark and felt that kind of darkness maybe a couple times in my life. Uh, One of them was on our honeymoon when we were down a mile below the earth in a cave. Anybody ever been in one of those deep caverns and they shut the lights off and it's just pitch black, but you can almost feel the, the moisture in the air. You can just feel it. It's almost that eerie feeling. Darkness was going to cover it. It says so that it can be felt. They will know. Let's go on here. Uh, verse 22. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven And there was a thick darkness throughout the land of Egypt for three days. You ever been in that circumstance in the middle of the night when the thunderstorm hit the transformers and all the power goes off and you're scrounging around for a candle, a flashlight, anything? Can you imagine having to deal with that for three days? One person could not see another. And for three days they did not move from where they were. Yet all the Israelites had light where they lived. Figure that one out. It's dark over here, but light right there. And remember, for three days, it wasn't morning and night. It was dark. One of the greatest gods of Egypt next to Pharaoh was the sun. The sun god Amun-Ra was the principal deity of the pantheon. He made all growth possible in their minds. Pharaoh called himself son of the sun. With three days of darkness, the principal deity was scorned. One of many hymns to the sun may help us feel their devotion to his deity. Listen to this song that they sang to Amun-Ra. Beautiful is thine appearing in the horizon of heaven, thou living sun. S-U-N. The first who lived. Thou risest in the eastern horizon and fillest every land with thy beauty. Thou art beautiful and great and glistened and art high above every land. Thy rays, they encompass the lands. So far as all that thou hast created, thou art raw and thou reachest unto their end and subduest them for thee. Thy dear son, the Pharaoh, thou art afar. Yet are by thy rays upon the earth. And on and on and on. They sang, son- sang sonnets to the sun god as they worshipped him. And yet, as the sun could do nothing, the deity of the sun god was scorned. Why? That they might know that I am God. This god means nothing. In all the above, many other gods could have been named which were denigrated by the various plagues. But by the sampling demonstrates that Yahweh openly and violently through his servants put every one of them to shame. Over and over. But it didn't stop there. Over and over we see that God gave plague after plague after plague for two reasons. That they may know that I am God and that they may come out and worship me where I am. As we come into Exodus chapter 11, In chapter 12, we see that the last plague was not only against the supreme God of Egypt, the Pharaoh himself, but also against the future Pharaoh, his son, the very next God, Horus of Egypt. He was to die on the same level as animals, not as a God. For the prophecy was that the firstborn of man and cattle would die. Hymns of worship to many Pharaohs have been found Here's one that they sang to Ramses II. The good God, the strong one, whom men praise, the Lord, in whom men make their boasts, who protecteth his soldiers, who maketh his boundaries on earth as his will. Not to God, capital G-O-D, but to Pharaoh God, G-O-D. 
they attributed what should be the glory given to God in heaven to a Pharaoh on earth. Here's what happened. Chapter 11, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. After that, he will let you go from here. And when he lets you go, he will drive you out from here. Now announce to the people that both men and women should ask their neighbors for gold and silver jewelry. The Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And the man Moses was feared in the land of Egypt by Pharaoh's officials and the people. So Moses said, this is what the Lord says. About midnight, I will go throughout Egypt. And every firstborn male in the land of Egypt will die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne to the firstborn of the servant girl who is behind the millstones, as well as every firstborn of the livestock. Then there will be a great cry of anguish throughout all the land of Egypt, such as never was before or will ever be again. He says, this will be the greatest sign that I am God. But against all the Israelites, whether man or beast, not even a dog will snarl, so that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. And all these officials of yours will come down to me and bow before me, saying, leave you and all the people who followed you, and after that I will leave. And he, let, and he left Pharaoh's presence in fierce anger. Here's the thing. You can watch Pharaoh, or you can watch Moses' life kind of change from the beginning to the end. In the beginning, here's this timid man who leans on his I can't speak very well crutch. Remember that? He leans on this crutch. I'm not a very good speaker. I don't know what to do. And God gives him Aaron, and Aaron is going to be his voice. And he's this shy. I mean, he's, he's going forward in obedience, but he's timid. And yet he's trying to have faith. And, and there's this struggle that's going on inside Moses' life. And then all of a sudden, he comes to the tenth plague. And say, this is what God's going to do. Can you see the change in Moses' demeanor from the first plague to the last? And he's getting more confident as he goes. And what's happening? The people around in Egypt, they're beginning to take notice of who Moses is. And they're beginning to respect and fear this man. Because they know that God's presence is with him. It's amazing here. As for the organization and powers of the government, everyone knew that the Pharaoh was an absolute monarch. And that his authority rested theoretically on his supposed divinity. He is constantly called the good God. And one of his most frequent titles designated him as the son of the sun god, Ra. And we know that his claim of divine parentage was not a mere figure of speech. It was meant to be taken literally. Because remember, theoretically, his son would be the next Pharaoh. And God says, there will be no more. I will be God. So he destroyed the firstborn son. He destroyed the firstborn of the livestock. He goes on to say, theoretically, of course, the Pharaoh's right to rule rested on his divinity. He was the begotten of the sun god, Amon-Ra, who took the form of the previous king for his purpose. And Amon-Ra was the enthusiastic approval of other gods placed on him and the throne and decreed a long and brilliant reign for him. But the people began to see that the gods, including Pharaoh, had no power over what he was doing. There's so much here. Over and over, God's saying, I want you to know who I am. I want to just kind of step on a limb for a little bit. But I think that's still God's plan for us today. Isn't it? That we would know him. Would you agree? He still wants us to know Him. Not just know facts about Him. See, anybody can read a book and gather facts. Not just here, but here. To know Him. And to make Him known. See, every time God displayed His power, the picture of His greatness was displayed. 
And that's what we ought to be seeking to do in our lives today. What God wanted for the children of Israel is no different than what he wants for us today. He wants us to know him. And he wants us to make him known. He wants the world to know that he is great. In Exodus 4, verses 22 and 23, God told the Egyptians, Israel, my son, my firstborn, let him go. If not, I will slay the firstborn. Then in Exodus 11 and 12, verse 29, we see that the last plague was against the firstborn and God fulfilled his promise. As if losing the future Pharaoh was not enough, even the god of storms, Baal, Zephon, could not help the army which was pursuing Israel into the desert. In plain view of his temple, the whole army of Pharaoh was destroyed, we see in Exodus 14. Baal of Syria was equated with by the Egyptians with their god Seth. And as the cruel sea was believed to be a manifestation of Seth, even their own gods were displayed as having the power to swallow them up. But God was the one that made it happen. Let me just kind of close in this last little segment by answering this question. What is Yahweh's purpose in the plagues? The first reason for the final plague was that the Egyptians may know that Yahweh is God. We see it in Exodus chapter five, 7, verse 5, chapter 8, verse 10, chapter 9, verses 14 through 16, and verse 27, chapter 10, verse 16, chapter 14, verse 4. Over and over, he says, I, this is my purpose, that they may know that I am God. The Lord is gracious in that he says over and over that he is doing this for the Egyptians that they might know that he is the Lord. In fact, among the Egyptians, those who exercised faith were saved. We see that in Acts chapter 9, verses 20 and 21. It says this, Those among Pharaoh's officials who feared the word of the Lord made their servants and the livestock flee to shelters. But those who didn't take the Lord's word seriously left their servants and livestock in the field. God spared some who believed. But for those who hardened their heart and would not regard God's word through his servant Moses, they suffered the consequence of their unbelief. And can we say that today there's still a consequence for unbelief? Just as we today have an incentive to believe in Christ because of his miracles, the Egyptians had the opportunity to believe because of the plagues. There's the first reason that they may understand who Yahweh is. Second reason is this. For the plagues was that Israel might know Yahweh. Not only that the Egyptians might know Yahweh, but that the Israelites might know Yahweh is their God. And there is no other. Chapter 10, verse 1 says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of the officials that they that I may do these miracle signs of mine among them, and so that you may tell your son and your grandson how severely I dealt with the Egyptians and perform miraculous signs among them, and you'll know that I am the Lord. Think about that just for a moment. What greater legacy would a man have than to be able to sit down with his children and grandchildren and tell them of the greatness of God? I mean, think about it. Can you imagine being Moses sitting down with his grandchildren and telling them what God has doing, what God had done and what he was doing? Can you imagine being the grandchild who heard all these incredible stories from your grandfather and now you're telling them to your son and your grandchildren? Wasn't that what he basically said in Deuteronomy chapter 6? Tell all the parents that they may tell their kids, that they may tell their kids, that they may tell their kids. What would be the logical result of every parent telling of the greatness of God to their kids and then their kids telling their kids and then their kids telling their kids? What would be the logical result of that? Everyone would know who God was. But realistic speaking, has that happened? No. The ball has been dropped. You see... And this is just kind of a little side trail just for a moment. It's not the church's responsibility to tell your kids who God is. It's our responsibility. Isn't that right? God gave the responsibility to train the kids to who? Parents. 
And if we don't do our job, we have no one to blame but ourselves. He says, I want you to tell your children and grandchildren that everyone may know that I am God. We need to pick that, that, that baton back up and run with it again. Just saying. Some of the Israelites seem to have lost faith in Jehovah during their servitude. Possibly they were impressed with the Egyptian gods, as some of them were. Um, but now Israel was to see evidence of Yahweh's absolute sovereignty and superiority over every Egyptian god. In fact, in Exodus chapter 10, we read that the Lord mocked the Egyptian gods. Why didn't Pharaoh believe? Why should he? He was a god himself, so to speak. If he believed, he would lose his divinity, but God hardened his heart. Why? Because if he had repented and let Israel go after the first plague, all the gods of Egypt would still have retained all their greatness and, and their majesty amongst the Egyptian people. But by spreading it out over ten plagues, God basically dealt with all the major Egyptian gods. He didn't just stop with the first one. He wanted all the gods of Egypt to be exposed. You ever thought about that? People had to suffer to demonstrate that all the gods other than Yahweh were absolutely nothing. Jethro summed it up well when he later said, in chapter, uh, chapter 18, verse 11, Now I know that Yahweh is greater than all gods, for in the thing wherein they dealt proudly, he was above them. Even Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, remember he was one that Moses was afraid of going to get permission to go to begin with? And now Jethro even knows Yahweh is above every other god. Necessary in the plan for Israel's salvation was that they should be a simple visible act that was to take a lamb, kill it, and put some of its blood on the doorpost of their dwelling. Egyptian symbolism is interesting even in this act, for a door was a symbol of both entry and defense. And gates played a special role on the journey of the deceased through nether world. For Israel, putting blood on the doorpost indicated that something done in one's heart is not enough. They had to act out their faith. Pharaoh could have saved his firstborn if he had done that, but he would have destroyed the Egyptian system. And in doing so, he would have acknowledged that Yahweh is God. And furthermore, sheep were an abomination to the Egyptians. Isn't that amazing? And yet God calls us his sheep. Yahweh's plan of salvation for Israel was not only to put down the gods of Egypt. God was calling out his people for himself. And this was his greater and higher purpose. For Israel to be a special people to the Lord, they had to break with the associations that they had in Egypt. They had to break from the Egyptian ties. They had to see three things. Number one, he is over all other gods. He is above every other god. First John chapter 3, verse 8. John chapter 12, 31 and following. He is the only God. Number two, that the lamb was slain and the blood brought deliverance. And we see that throughout the book of John. John 1, 29, Acts 20, 28, Ephesians 1, 7, and so forth. The lamb was slain and the blood brought deliverance. And number three, that this family, this is family-oriented salvation. Exodus chapter 12, verse 3 and 3 says, uh, Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, they must each select an animal of the flock according to their father's households, one animal per household. Verse 4, if the household is too small for a whole animal, that person and the neighbor nearest the house are to select one based on the combined number of people. You should apportion the animal according to, to what each person will eat. It was a family-oriented salvation. But just a final thought here. Jesus, or Yeshua, or Hebrew means salvation, instituted the new covenant at a Passover meal. And today the family of faith partakes of this meal, a sign of deliverance. Hebrew means deliverer from the bondage of Egypt and from their gods. Jeremiah and Ezekiel both prophesied of a new covenant, which would include not only outward signs, but renewed hearts and minds. 
And anyone today can enter this covenant through the acknowledging of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. You know, it's amazing. Over and over, I want them to know that I am God. And I want the fathers to tell their children, and I want their children to tell their children that I am God. The question I want to close with this morning is this. Do you know him? Do you know his powerful, how, how great and majestic he is? Think about this just for a minute and I close. The Lord makes himself known by revealing his awesome power and thereby gives the players the opportunity to recognize him. Ultimately, the Lord reveals himself by distinguishing himself between him and everyone else. The difference being that the Lord and everyone else is enhanced in the following ways as seen in the plagues, which appear three series of three with a tenth and final plague standing alone. Plagues one through three. The Lord distinguishes between his servants Moses and Aaron and the servants of the Egyptian gods and the magicians. Although the Egyptian magicians duplicated the first two plagues, they could not reverse the effects. And they cannot duplicate the third plague, finally recognizing the finger of God, as we said. The first two they were able to copy. The third one they could not, and they could not reduce the effects of it. And he says, truly, this is the finger of God. In plagues four through six, the Lord distinguishes between his people and the, the Israelites and the Egyptians. While the first three plagues affected all of Egypt, the next three don't impact the land of Goshen where the Israelites lived. God made a distinction. In plagues seven, eight, and nine, the Lord distinguishes between himself and everyone else. In these plagues, he demonstrates that there is only one, there, that there is none like me in all the earth. Therefore, the severity of the plagues is without precedent. And the tenth and final plague, that was to the firstborn. And over and over, the tenth plague, the three ways that the Lord distinguished himself will reappear in the tenth plague. The plague of the firstborn, Moses, the Israelites, and the Lord are all differentiated again. And moreover, the Lord executes the tenth plague himself and not through Moses and Aaron. And the tenth plague is outside this series. And unlike the other nine, has nothing to do with natural events, completely defying any explanation that denies the power of God. We saw in the beginning of this section on the plagues how science tried to disprove and discredit. It could be this, it might be that. The tenth plague says there is nothing but the power of God involved in this. And it's true. And it's purely seen that God is in charge. Question is, do we know him? If we do know him, are we making him known? And are we worshiping him? He says that they may know that I am God. And that they may come out and worship me. And through this, are you teaching your kids and grandkids who I am? Three principles just stand out through this section on the plagues. Are we obedient to that? See, just because it was through the children of Israel and doesn't make it less viable for us today, does it? We still have something to learn through this. Even though it happened hundreds and thousands of years ago, we still learn from it today, right? Right? God still wants us to know that He is the only God. He still wants us to come out and worship Him. And he still wants us to make him known. True? Are we doing that? Still just as practical for us today. The question is, do you know him? Are you making him known? Are you worshiping him? Let's pray.